So vomiting is going to be more prominent in small bowel obstruction than ileus and large bowel obstruction. Abdominal distension is going to be more prominent in large bowel obstruction than it is in SBO and ileus. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that there are two types of vomiting a patient can have, bilious and fecalate. So the patient with SBO are more likely to have bilious vomiting and large bowel obstruction will have fecalate vomit. Now, I want to take this one step further and we're going to split small bowel obstruction into proximal obstructions and distal. And there are key differences here as well. Now we said before that vomiting is more prominent in small bowel obstructions than large bowel obstructions. Now in small bowel obstruction itself, vomiting is more prominent in proximal small bowel obstructions. That's in comparison to distal, right? And abdominal distension is more prominent with distal SBOs. But if we were to compare in a bigger spectrum, large bowel obstruction will produce a greater distension than distal. So to simplify this, abdominal distension and same thing vomiting it will be worse in proximal SBO, worse than distal, and distal will be worse than large bowel obstruction. And proximal is most like more likely to have bilious vomit, whereas distal SBO and large bowel obstruction will have fecalate vomit. Those are the key differences. But overall, they all present in a very similar manner and rarely ever are you going to be able to diagnose which type of obstruction the patient has just by, you know, um, just by the clinical presentation, right? Like as we discussed, distal small bowel obstruction can produce fecalate vomit and it can cause a lot of distension. So that's kind of similar to how large bowel obstruction is. So you see how, you see my point? It's very hard to differentiate between them. But overall, at the end of the day, it really doesn't make a difference, right? Because the management is going to be very similar for all of these obstructions. And at the end of the day, uh, regardless of the clinical presentation, you're going to need some sort of imaging to confirm. So I hope that makes sense. Now let's move on to the diagnostic approach. So the initial test of choice should always be abdominal x-ray if you suspect bowel obstruction. And the reason for that is because abdominal x-rays are very readily available and they're very cheap. But you have to know the pros and cons of abdominal x-rays. Abdominal x-ray will help you rule out bowel obstruction, but it will not help you differentiate between different types of bowel obstructions. So what I mean by that is that on abdominal x-ray, you might see dilated loops of bowel, right? Now this might be because patient might have proximal or distal small bowel obstruction, or because patient might have ileus. Okay, or a patient might have a closed loop bowel obstruction, but you're not going to be able to differentiate this on abdominal x ray because it's not very sensitive. I'm sorry, it's not very specific. It's sensitive for bowel obstructions, but it's not, it's not specific. Okay, so sensitive meaning it will detect if patient has obstruction, but it's not going to be able to specifically tell you which type of obstruction the patient might have. Okay. And another thing is, uh, with the ileus, you will see usually dilation of both the small and the large bell. And the same can be seen with large bell obstructions, especially if the patient's been sitting on it for a few days, they're gonna have some degree of small bell dilation as well. So there are a lot of limitations with abdominal x-rays. But once you have confirmed that there are dilated loops of bell, then the next step should be CAT scan. And preferably, you want to do this with IV contrast and PO contrast. And there are a couple of reasons for that, right? The PO contrast is going to help you definitively find the transition point, right? You give the contrast, let the patient sit for an hour after the contrast is given. And by that time, by the time patient gets to the CAT scan, the contrast is going to stop exactly where the obstruction is, 
okay and not only that it'll help you determine if it's a partial versus a complete obstruction and not only that the contrast can act as therapeutic because once the gastrographin is sitting at the transition point it starts absorbing water from the surrounding bell now what that does it, it creates a lot of pressure at the obstruction point and sometimes forcefully opens it up now there are not a lot of studies supporting this this is all theoretical but what has been supported by the studies is that if you give contrast to these patients they have a shorter hospital stay and the reason for that is when you give the contrast to the patient you can uh, repeat cat scan 24 hours after the cat scan was done if you see the contrast has made it into the colon you can start feeding the patient without waiting for bowel function okay normally you would wait for patient to either have flatus or a bowel movement and that can take time okay but that doesn't always mean the patient hasn't opened up if the patient got PO contrast you can repeat a, a abdominal x-ray and to see if it made it at the level of the colon and if it did that means the obstruction has resolved and you can start feeding the patient and sometimes that process of feeding the patient can weaken the bowels up okay and it can speed up the process of having bowel function so those are the benefits of PO contrast and now let's move on to the benefits of IV contrast so as we had discussed before the bowel has these small vessels supplying blood right but when you have an obstruction the bowel dilates and this can cut off the circulation and now to see if this work if the circulation is intact or not you give IV contrast and the IV contrast would normally travel through these vessels and light up these vessel on uh, these bowel walls this will happen during the capillary phase and if you want to learn more about capillary phase and the other phases uh, of the CAT scan with IV contrast, then you can check out my video on CAT scan abdomen pelvis, which I put out a few weeks ago, and learn about all the different phases and the benefits of using. But for mobile bowel obstruction, you can give IV contrast and see if the bowel walls are lighting up or not. If they're not lighting up, that means the perfusion has been cut off and the patient is developing bowel ischemia and should go to the OR to possibly reverse this effect. Now lastly, we'll discuss management. So for ileus, you wanna treat it conservatively with NG tube, if patient's having nausea and vomiting, IV fluids, and fix the electrolytes. Now many a times, people think ileus is a surgical issue. It's actually not. The reason why you might confuse that is because you most commonly seen after surgeries, during the post-op period, and that's why it can be confusing that it's a surgical issue, but it's really not. Uh, the only time surgical surgical team takes care of ileus is post-operatively, okay? If patient is coming to the ED, they need to find out what the underlying cause of ileus is, which can be endocrine or neurological uh, in nature. It can be a new medication that the patient started. It can be secondary to an electrolyte abnormalities like low potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, or high magnesium. So all those are medical issues that need to be reversed and fixed. And if that's done so, then the pa then the ileus will resolve, okay? And in the meantime, uh, you place an NG tube to decompress the patient and you give them IV fluids because they're gonna be NPO. And if the patient's post-op and they've been NPO for a long period of time already, then you can consider starting the patient on TPN. Now in terms of small bowel obstruction, the management's quite similar. You place NG tube, keep them NPO, start them on IV fluids, and do serial abdominal exams. And no pain meds. So the two main things that you need to focus on are the serial abdominal exam and no pain meds, okay? So the reason why you wanna do serial abdominal exams is because you wanna know if the pain is getting worse or not. With NG tube, NPO, and IV fluids, their pain should be improving, okay? And if they're not improving, especially within 24 hours, then that has earned them a trip to the OR. Or if before the 24 hour window, their pain has gotten worse, then that's a sign the patient is developing ischemia and you should take them to the OR. Now, the reason why we say avoid pain meds is because you want to know when the patient's having pain, okay? Because the pain is the only symptom of bowel ischemia that you're going to have unless you do a CAT scan with IV contrast. Now, you're not going to do a, a CAT scan with IV contrast every eight hours, every six hours to assess for ischemia. So the one thing you have to rely on is 
the patient to tell you if they have pain. And if they, if you if you have standing pain med orders for them, they're not going to feel anything. And, you know, you're not going to realize if they're developing ischemia or not until it's too late. So something to keep in mind. Now, in terms of large bowel obstruction, the management is somewhat similar. The initial management, uh, you will do NG2 for decompression. You keep that patient NPO and start them on IV fluids. Now, remember, uh, when we were talking about etiologies, malignancy is the most common cause of large bowel obstruction. So if malignancy is the most common cause, that means there's a um, tumor burden somewhere that's causing the obstruction. So it's not going to resolve on it on, on its own as it does with small bowel obstruction and ileus. With ileus, you treat the underlying cause, ileus goes away. With small bowel obstruction, you give the patient enough time and the adhesion eventually breaks off and the patient opens up and they don't need surgery. A lot of times they don't need surgery. Large bowel obstruction is different. The tumor is not just gonna magically disappear. So you have to do something about it. So the first step is, you put a stent in, you call the gastroenterology team, you find out where the tumor is by doing endoscopy. So they can do a colonoscopy, see where the tumor is, and they put a stent in to allow for decompression, okay? Once the bowel has decompressed, then the patient will need to go to the operating room to get that mass taken out. Now, why is it important to decompress the patient before going to the OR? Let's take a look. So for laparoscopic cases, right? Let's say this is the abdominal wall and here are the bowels, right? So when you do a laparoscopic case, you put in a port and you push air through it, right? And what this does is it creates space for us. That air creates space between the bowel and the abdominal wall. Okay, this is our working space right here. But in large bowel obstruction, both the large and the small bowel might be dilated. Now, if they're dilated, no matter how much air you push in, it's not going to do anything because the bowels are so dilated. So you don't have a lot of working room. But now if GI comes in and decompresses the patient, then that bowel is going to get decompressed and you will have your normal space to work. Okay, That way you don't have to do exploratory laparotomy. You can get away with doing a laparoscopic case, which is much, much better for the patient short term in terms of recovery and long term. Because remember... When you're doing exploratory laparotomy, when you have open, uh, when you have open surgeries, uh, these patients are more likely to develop scar tissue inside the belly, which will develop into adhesions, resulting in small bowel obstructions. So those are all things you have to think about. It's better to do the case laparoscopically than open, and we should take every step possible uh, to avoid open cases. So just to review. Ileus does not require any surgical intervention. You find out what the underlying cause is and you fix the underlying cause. Treat the underlying etiology. Now for small bowel obstructions, the majority of them can be treated conservatively with just NG tube, NPO, IV fluids, and monitoring their abdominal exams and not giving them pain meds. You're gonna look for signs of ischemia. The moment they develop these signs of ischemia, then you have to take them to the OR, unfortunately. Large bowel obstructions, you can initially treat them conservatively and decompress them with getting GI involved and putting a stent, but after that, they are going to need surgery, okay? So SBOs can be treated conservatively, and large bowel obstructions will almost always need surgery because underlying cause is either um, malignancy or sigmoid valvulus. Uh, diverticulitis is different. Obviously, you treat the underlying infection and the obstruction should resolve because it's probably reactive from the infection. Um, but otherwise, mostly it's called by malignancy, sigmoid valvulus, and both of those do require surgical intervention eventually. That's it for this video, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed the content, learned something new today. And if you did, please like and share this video with your friends and colleagues. I would greatly appreciate it. And that's it for this video. Until next time, take care, guys.